Emerging from the desert like a fart bubble floating defiantly on the surface, the Las Vegas Sphere is the latest in a long line of spheroidal human constructions. Spheres always seem to be at the center of human civilization's greatest achievements. Other examples include ancient Roman monuments to the gods, or entire ecosystems trapped in a globe, or this one that Veritasium loves so much. It feels absolutely incredible. But with a construction so desperate to stay at the bleeding edge of technology and social acceptability, why did it turn to such a dumb shape for its flamboyant display? With a single stroke of a compass, architects can create all the design drawings they need for a sphere. The plan, the section, and the elevation. Spherical buildings are the ultimate trick perpetrated on the world by architects. The least amount of work for them yields the most amount of work and expense for everyone else. Like, how do you build this thing? These dizzying domes also require the latest technological advancements to make up for their utter lack of functional geometry, like insane speaker systems. The Sphere unveiling what it calls the world's most advanced audio system. And they inevitably provide the most confusing experience for anyone visiting it. Where am I again? Curiously though, it's also for these reasons that we celebrate spherical buildings so enthusiastically and why they're so universally held up as cultural masterpieces. It's probably the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I'm not even joking. Romans, Enlightenment thinkers, real estate shysters, and even Canadians get on the action. Does the Las Vegas Sphere offer a new inductee to this spherical hall of fame? Or will this bubble burst like your Vegas dreams come dawn? The Sphere is like a software build that's been undergoing revisions for thousands of years. Updates tend to come during eras when people believe that underneath all the complexity of the world, there lies a few simple universal truths. Throughout the cycles of history, that comes up time and time again. For the Greeks and the Romans, those easy to follow rules might have been extolled by people like Plato. He was a huge fan of spheres, and he thought that they were the most perfect and pure geometric form. They're always symmetrical, and they don't have any of those pesky corners because nobody puts baby in a corner. Spheres were also at the heart of his understanding of the split between the way the world lives in our minds and the physical world that lives outside of them. Humans will never be able to build perfect geometries like spheres, Plato thought, because the absolutely perfect ones only live in our minds. Physical versions of spheres, and all things for that matter, are always doomed to be imperfect with their surface texture or slightly misshapen contours. But as humans, we should still try to build spheres in the pursuit of perfection and to keep our eye on the goal of a more orderly universe. After Plato, you might get people like Isaac Newton, who believed that a few universal laws governed everything and that fundamental forces, like gravity, worked in spherical ways. During the Earth-conscious 20th century, spheres were revered as the form with the best performance. They can be built rigidly with light materials, and they have the greatest interior volume for the least amount of surface area. Countless attempts to save the world with large ball-shaped designs sprouted up all over and even in space. Today, the sphere is the perfect form for creating the largest visual spectacle imaginable. The form draws as many people in as possible, 20,000 of them at a time, and it is the epitome of efficiency as it extracts everyone's money and transfers it to others. There's no simpler or more universal truth than that. Plato, Sir Isaac Newton, and James Dolan, CEO of MSG, the developer of the Sphere, all great men with ball-shaped dreams. The most efficient way to achieve the cosmic goal of today's spherical construction is to spend $2.3 billion on a 157-meter or 560-foot diameter sphere that sticks out of the dusty Earth 112 meters or 366 feet. You should wrap it in 1.2 million LEDs that light up precisely choreographed ways, providing the illusion of spinning basketballs or smiley faces. Inside of that sphere, you'll also need the world's largest LED display, 167,000 speakers, and a weather system that pumps wind and various smells at you. In there, you can show Darren Aronofsky movies and concerts by that band that is somehow preloaded on my iPhone and plays automatically when I put on my headphones. This is the Pantheon in Rome, Italy. It was built in 125 AD and was commissioned by the Emperor Hadrian. It has a sphere inside of it too, but it's only 43 meters or 142 feet in diameter, about a quarter of the size of the Vegas version. But just like its larger, later cousin dedicated to money, the religion of Las Vegas, the Pantheon was dedicated to the religion of ancient Rome, its 12 gods. Romans believed that each god had control over a distinct domain of everyday life. Each of those 12 areas were personified in a god that had an epic backstory that explained their weird personalities and motivations. 
Apollo is the god of music and the arts, while Mercury is the god of trade and commerce. According to Roman mythology, the two were best buds. Just look at how happy they are when Mercury gave back the bow and arrow that he stole. And even today, the domains they represent, arts and profiteering, they live happily together, nowhere cozier than at the Las Vegas Sphere. But back in Rome, depictions of the gods live tucked away in their own little niches that line the walls of the Pantheon. If you stand at the center of the circular building, you're surrounded equally on all sides by all the 12 deities. And that's the power of a circle by definition. It's a closed, two-dimensional figure where all points of the boundary are equidistant from a given point. In the Pantheon, you get to occupy the center, literally and symbolically. It doesn't pump wind or specially prepared scents while you stand there, though, like the Las Vegas version. In the Pantheon, there is an opening above you, though, that offers direct connection to the heavens. It's called an oculus. And then curving down from there is still the largest unreinforced concrete dome in the world. The dome was poured in layers using temporary wooden formwork on the interior. Each layer gets more and more progressively lighter as the concrete mix incorporated more and more pumice. The imprinted squares on the interior, they're called coffers. They remove unnecessary weight while keeping materials strategically in the right locations to be able to provide structural rigidity for the dome to be able to stand up. And finally, the overall geometry is cleverly manipulated so that all the forces of the weight and construction make their way down to the earth. So Sphere 1.0 was about gods, the universe, and man. 1,500 years later, Sphere 2.0 dealt with kind of the same stuff, but in a slightly different order. We're also again at a time when it seemed like the world could be distilled down to just a few essential truths. And again, spheres were at the tasty centers of those ideas. This era was called the Enlightenment. And unlike the light pollution of the sphere, this Enlightenment didn't cause traffic accidents or confuse migrating birds. Instead, it was a time when humans were testing how their reason and the things that they made could become more central to their overall worldview. Scientists like Sir Isaac Newton or philosophers like Voltaire, they believed in the power of rational thought to wipe away misguided superstitions and other ignorance. Architects wanted into the action too, and they sought to rethink how buildings might become more rational. And there's nothing more rational than a house shaped like a ball. That's what architect Claude Nicolas Ledoux believed. In fact, he called this the ideal house. And it's ideal because spheres are ideal shapes in nature. The rooms were admittedly a bit awkward on the interior as they were arranged in a grid, but then centered around a fireplace in the middle. This design was also meant to encourage more community and, and like a social living environment, another reflection of environmental ideals. The design was a conceptual philosophical statement told through the design of a dysfunctional house. And if balls are what you're into, he made a design for that too. It's a brothel with balls. They are where you'd hang out before heading into the shaft or whatever, you get it. Ledoux learned this kind of circular logic from his teacher, Etienne Louis Boulet, who also liked big balls. And he designed the real beta build of the Las Vegas sphere, the cenotaph for Sir Isaac Newton. This one is a 150 meter or 500 foot sphere chosen for its association with the physics of gravity, celestial bodies, and the overall universe. The shell would have been perforated in a star-like pattern of the night sky. So during the day, light from the outside would glow on the interior through the holes and present the illusion of night. And on the interior was a giant glowing orb representing the sun. And it would shine at night, turning the interior into a space that felt like day. The cenotaph to Sir Isaac Newton could bend time and physics, and by the 20th century, we arrive at the next version of the sphere. These versions were all about celebrating technology as the solution to all of our problems. In 1906, architect Samuel Freed announced his plan to build a colossal sphere. He called it the Coney Island Globe Tower, a 700-foot tall, 11-story structure. It graced the cover of the New York Tribune, drawing in readers to invest in a ground floor chance to share profits in the largest steel structure ever erected, the greatest amusement enterprise in the whole world, the best real estate venture. The $1.5 billion project would have contained restaurants, an observatory, the United States Weather Observation Bureau, a vaudeville theater, the world's largest ballroom, a bowling alley and a roller skating rink, casinos, a 50,000 room hotel, a 5,000 seat hippodrome, and four circus rings. And a partridge in a pear tree. Freed's sphere turned out to be one of the largest architectural frauds in human history, conning investors out of thousands. It seems like spheres don't always make solid investments. 
On the lighter side, Buckminster Fuller was as sphere obsessed as anyone and he likes spheres literally lightweight. He was on an obsessive mission to find the lightest way possible to construct them. Just look how happy he is with all those balls on the shelf behind him. Small ones, big ones. But he also liked triangles. And he tried to build spheres out of triangles. He called them geodesics. Either way, technology and geometry would help save the world, or what he called Spaceship Earth. Buckminster Fuller famously asked another technocratic architect, probably in a really derisive tone, how much does your building weigh? And I'm sure he would have asked the exact same thing of the Las Vegas Sphere too. And well, it weighs 13,000 tons. That's three tons more than the Eiffel Tower. And it's full of enough steel to build yourself train tracks all the way to Los Angeles, a great way to get out of Las Vegas. But anyway, spheres. They're good enough to be the shape of the earth, so they're good enough for me. A lot of ambitious people in the 20th century agreed with me and made stuff like the 1939 Paris Sphere in New York, or the Montreal Biosphere, or Epcot. Fuller helped with the last two. Inside each of these were full technologically advanced microcosms of life. And just like life, they each died tragically. The Perisphere was melted to make guns during World War II. The Biosphere burst into an epic flaming hell. Now it's a museum with exhibitions about water, climate change, and sustainable development. Kill me now. And then there's, well, Epcot, originally planned as a 50-acre domed city of tomorrow. Instead, we got this. During this time, spheres were also the answer to surviving nuclear disasters by living underground, or conversely, by living in space. Look at this crazy thing for 300,000 people. And of course, Palpatine and the Genosians gave us the daddy of them all, the Death Star. A spherical building is the same on all sides, including towards the sky. It's the ultimate icon. From whatever angle, it, it looks exactly the same. And this is a powerful marketing tool. From an airplane, the sphere is easy to point out. In a place with all kinds of Roman recreations in the form of giant hotels, sculptures, fountains, and indoor gondola rides, it's no wonder that this is where a developer would try and take on building something as ambitious as the Pantheon. But there's all sorts of other examples that it might be drawing upon too. And that's why I think it's important to take a look at original builds, to identify which balls fill you with warm feelings of joy, and which are highly engineered spectacles masquerading as something that they're not. Recently, James Dolan, CEO of MSG and the developer of the Las Vegas Sphere, he was accused of sexual assault. I've been following the development of the story pretty closely, and so have a lot of others. There's over 95 articles about it across the web. Of those, some are left-leaning and some right, and it's often difficult to know just by reading one single article. But Ground News allows me to get the news while simultaneously understanding the overarching arguments that are being made and who's making them. Ground News is a website and an app that was designed by a former NASA engineer who is on a mission to give readers an easy, data-driven, and objective way to read the news. Every story comes with a quick visual breakdown of the political bias, its factuality, and the ownership of the sources reporting, all backed by ratings from three independent news monitoring organizations. For instance, let's look at this story about Oklahoma City's plan to build the tallest skyscraper in the U.S. Right away, you can see that 52 news outlets reported this story. Of these 52, 29% were leaning left, while 16% leaned right. You can also see the factuality and the ownership trends for this story. 83% of the reporting outlets are owned by media conglomerates. Ground News also allows you to compare headlines so that you can see how this bias might affect framing. For this story, the headlines are pretty similar across the board. However, if you dig deeper into the articles, the reporting could be quite different. With their Bias Insight feature, you can see specific differences in the reporting. For instance, for this story, both the left and right focus on the skyscraper itself, while the center focuses on the tower's inclusion of residential, dining, and hospitality spaces. And that's why I keep coming back to Ground News. It's a fantastic tool for sifting through the daily misinformation bias. They provide all the tools that you need to be a critical thinker today, and I cannot recommend it enough. In fact, I believe that Ground News is so useful that I'm offering 40% off of their Vantage subscription. You can only access this discount with my link, so go to ground.news slash Stuart Hicks or click on the link in the video description and support an independent news platform working to make the media landscape more transparent. And as always, thanks for watching.